Okay, so we are recording and we're ready to go. As I just mentioned, it's a, a new course that we're going to be getting into on the life and the thinking of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And I'm just going to go around and mute people as I introduce. But as I always say, just because I'm muting you, please don't feel muted. Okay, and I want to hear your perspective. His material is really so engaging and so relevant. And we'll certainly take time as we go through this first essay that I want to show you to, to discuss and to deliberate and to reflect on, on the points that he's making. Um, just by way of a very brief introduction, more on the personal side, I credit Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel with my ultimate decision to become a rabbi. Whoa. That's how much of an influence this person has had on my life. When I was in my junior year at Brandeis, I was really fortunate to take a class that was completely on Heschel, everything Heschel. I think on the syllabus was every book Heschel ever wrote. And that was a class that was offered by a professor at Brandeis who's since retired, Ed Kaplan, who was Heschel's biographer. And he's written the, the great authoritative uh, biography on Heschel called Spiritual Radical, which is worth looking at if anyone wants to really get a full picture of Heschel's life. We're not going to look at it together over this Zoom. We're going to look more into his, his theology and his philosophy and a little bit of his poetry too. But when I started to read Heschel's material, it blew me away. Because until that point, really my engagement with Judaism, it was a little on the lighter side. You know, I had a good Hebrew school experience, a good bar mitzvah experience, but I had been taking classes in philosophy and theology and I hadn't really been exposed to the deeper, the deeper elements within Judaism. And remember, Heschel was not just a, a secularly trained philosopher, though he did have that training in secular philosophy. He comes from a Hasidic dynasty. Um, I believe his great grandfather was one of the, was one of the great Hasidic rebbe's. He has an interest in mysticism and Kabbalah, and so when he's writing, he's writing for a very much an American audience, the Jewish typical. Jewish American scene of the 1950s and 60s, but underlying his writing, his philosophy, his poetry is that much more mystical side, Kabbalah and his Hasidic roots. Um, just a, a word about his biography, uh, a very brief word because I do want to get into his thoughts, but Heschel um, was born in Poland. Okay, born in Poland, and he studied in Berlin. He had a lot of secular training as well as a, a real yeshivish kind of upbringing. Um, he was fortunate enough to leave Europe, I think it was six or seven weeks before it would have been impossible for him to leave in 1938. Uh, the rest of his family was not as fortunate as, as he was his sister, uh, two sisters, his mother, pretty much his entire family perished in the Shoah, uh, some in camps, some not in camps. And so as we dig into his writing, though not all of his philosophy is reflecting on the Shoah, explicitly talking about the Holocaust, it's there. It's always there underneath everything that we're reading and that we're seeing. And it's that it's the kind of thing that you can't, it can't not be there. You know, someone once said that Jewish theology after the Shoah, after the Holocaust, it's, it's completely different. It's completely different. The terms with which, the terms that we're working with have completely changed in every way. The rules of engagement have changed. After something so horrible and so devastating, everything we thought about God and our faith up until that point, we have to stop and really question, really reflect on in a, in a different way. And that's true with, in, with Heschel too. He came to New York, he first taught at the Hebrew Union College, which is the Reform Seminary. And 
later made the switch to my alma mater and Rabbi Klein's alma mater, the Jewish Theological Seminary. By the way, it's just, it's incredible mazel that we're starting a class on Heschel today because there's really big news coming out of the seminary today. I see Linda nodding. Linda, yeah, did you I, see? Yes, I saw it. Um, they have a new, uh, oh my God, the word just went right out. I know new who Chancellor. it is, Shuley, new Chancellor, Shuley Rubin Schwartz. So it's a, oh, it's a monumental yeah. day in the history Monument. of the seminary. Um, yeah, I think I, in the I seminary's 137 year history, Shuley, Dr. Shuley Rubin Schwartz, who I took a class with my final year at the seminary, wonderful professor and just an incredible person overall, will be the first female chancellor of the seminary. So really big news, exciting news for the future of the, of the seminary and of the movement. Um, really, we'll, we'll really um, have a lot to, to look forward to as we see what she begins to do and how she begins to shape the future of the, of the movement and with the new building. It really is an exciting time. But all that to say that Heschel found himself as a professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary, training future conservative rabbis, um, and he took on as his field of expertise theology, theology, and also Kabbalah and mysticism. And he was a professor who taught more on the mystical side. As I mentioned, that was a, a part of his background. Now, one thing you should know about the seminary is that in those days especially, and it's still true even today, though less so, but in those days especially, Talmud was regarded as the most important thing. If you were anybody, if you were any type of scholar whatsoever, you were studying Talmud. And if Talmud was up here, where do you think Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism was? On the ground. You had your Talmud department, you had your Bible department, you had your history and literature department, then you had your Hebrew, and all the way down at the very bottom, people did not, in those days especially, Kabbalah was views, viewed as something that's very weird, very foreign, it doesn't make rational sense, it's not scientific. And so Heschel, the incredible scholar and, and, and writer that he was, and he was authoring many of his famous works during the time that he was a professor at the seminary, was not regarded as highly then by many of the faculty and students as he is today. And there were some who looked at him as kind of like the crazy absent-minded philosopher. And he was that type. If you look on YouTube, you can find some video footage remaining of Heschel when he spoke. And he was a little bit out there, okay, big hair. And he spoke with this thick Eastern European accent. And he, he was kind of a um, not necessarily the easiest person for um, a new generation of American rabbis to relate to. And that's part of the story of the seminary in general, that in the early days of the seminary, you know, certainly before my time, um, it was very often the case that young American rabbis were being trained by Eastern European rabbis who were great scholars who had come in with their yeshiva background. And there was a bit of a mismatch that those great scholars from the, from the Eastern European yeshivas didn't necessarily know what American rabbis would need to be able to serve American communities in the suburbs and places like Merrick and beyond. Um, that is part of the story, though. I think with Heschel, it's a little different because Heschel's message was so ahead of its time, was so ahead of its time. He was a voice at the seminary for spirituality, for practical spirituality, for learning how to live with a sense of awe and wonder and appreciation for the mystery of the world. And he had that piece of his thought. And of course, the other side, which is the side that we're gonna begin with today, was his fervent, fervent passion for justice. 
Heschel was someone who refused to remain silent in the face of any evil whatsoever. And you could say that that came from his, his own family background in the Shoah, but it also came from his lifelong fascination with the prophets. Heschel's PhD thesis was on the prophets, a deep study um, into the consciousness, the way of thinking that the prophets of the Bible had. And really what goes along with that is their call for justice, their passionate call for justice. Um, Heschel, in probably the most famous photograph that we have of him, is marching alongside Dr. King. And I encourage everyone, maybe I'll put it up on the screen share, to just appreciate for a moment that picture. You know what, I'll put it up on the screen share now because it's a good lead into the material for today. Okay, and we're going to be reading one of his essays today that I'll put in the screen share, but then I'll send around as well. I'll send around as well. So let's go into screen share mode. And I, I hope that we'll spend today really looking at um, an essay that deals with his thinking on social justice and on interfaith dialogue. The reason I wanted to start there and not with his more theological work, his work dealing with God, um, explicitly thinking about God, is because of what's going on in the world today. And the fact that our country is in need of incredible healing and we are broken as a country right now. And if there's any voice that can help us to try to make sense of that and what we can do as people of faith to come together and, and try to bring some healing to the world, I think Heschel's voice is the voice we need to hear. So that's where I wanna start. But let me start by showing you this, this remarkable picture. And I'm gonna go into the screen share. Got it, got it. Okay, can everyone see okay? Okay, so this is, this is a very famous picture of, of Heschel standing next to, to King, and there's another rabbi there, Maurice Eisendrath, and they're holding a Torah, and they're marching together for civil rights, marching together for justice and equality. And you might have heard the famous line that Heschel spoke when he was reflecting later in life on this moment of marching with Dr. King, what he said was, I felt like I was praying with my legs. I felt like I was praying with my legs. And you can understand what he meant by that. That for a pious Jewish person, a religious Jew who davens, davens every day, prays from the sea door, but does so, you know, really kind of either sitting or standing there in shul, he felt marching for that in that moment, marching for justice and standing up for what he and what Dr. King believed in, which is really peaceful resistance. He felt that he was offering a prayer through his legs with each step that he took. And I always hold on to that image that, you know, our prayers don't have to just be what happens when we sit with a sidor and go through the words, that, that we really can pray through our actions but we can pray with our whole bodies. And that's what Heschel was getting at there. Any questions about who he was, um, about his, is the screen share working? Oh, because it says it's paused. Works okay? It's working. Oh, all right, great. So any questions about anything that I've set up until now about the direction of where I want to go in the class or you know, some of the things that I mentioned about his life. If not, we're gonna go right into the first essay I wanna study. Anybody? Okay, good. So this is a famous essay, among his most famous essays. All of Heschel's great essays are collected in one volume that is called Moral Grandeur and Spiritual Audacity. How's that for an awesome book title? Moral Grandeur 
and spiritual audacity. If you had to sum up Heschel's life as a rabbi, you could sum it up, I think, with those four words. And that book I know is available on Amazon and anybody who is at all interested in getting a window into Heschel or learning more about really our faith in general and what we stand for as Jews, that is a book I cannot recommend highly enough. This is one of the essays found in that book. It's called No Religion is an Island. And a little bit of the background about this essay before we start to read it probably will take us two classes. Um, this was an address that was delivered at the Union Theological Seminary. The Union Theological Seminary. Does anyone happen to know where UTS, where the Union Theological Seminary is located? It's in the village next to and not too far from NYU. Close. You might be thinking of a different Protestant seminary because there is one no, there. Not too. a Protestant, a Reformed sem uh, seminary. This is a little different. This is the Union Theological Seminary, um, one of the world's leading Protestant seminaries, training, yeah, training. Yeah, uh, yeah. I believe it's right here. Yes. Yes, yeah. So Ira and Linda, that's true. And Sarah, there is, I think, another one down by the village, but this one that I'm referring to that Heschel spoke at is right across the street from JTS. It's one of the most amazing facts about being a student at JTS that you literally walk across the street and you have access to some of the world's leading Christian scholars and Christian theologians and really up and coming Christian clergy. And part of the benefit of being a student at either institution is the classes are cross-listed. So as a Jewish student, I can go across the street to Union and take a class if I wanted to on something Christian related and vice versa. And that happens quite a bit. Heschel in 1966 was invited to give a keynote address, a very important address to the staff and the faculty and the students of Union Theological Seminary. So think about it. There's this famous rabbi across the street, Rabbi Heschel, this great mystical rabbi. And at Union, they said, we want, a, we want to hear an address about interfaith dialogue, about how religions can work together to address the ills of our world and of our country. And they invited Heschel to speak. And this is what he said, 1966, thinking about what the world was then. And as we study this essay and as we study all of his essays, what would he say to us today? How has what he said then really in, in some ways become even more relevant than it was back when he said it. So without further ado, let's go, go through it. It's a bit of a long essay. We'll skip around a bit. And I think it'll take us two classes maybe. And then after this, we can get into some of his theology, some of his thinking around God and prayer and those sorts of topics. So I'm going to do some of the reading. Okay, but I want to I want to pass it around so that I don't do all the reading. And uh, we'll stop for discussion. This is No Religion is an Island. He walks up to the microphone, and this is how he begins. Can everyone see? Make it a little bigger. I don't have it. I We still have the photo up. The picture. You need to click on that, yeah. Got it. How's that? Yeah. Yes. Got it? Okay. I speak as a member of a congregation whose founder was Avraham, and the name of my rabbi is Moses. <laughs> How's that for an opening line? He's not beginning by saying, I'm a conservative Jew. My teachers are at the Jewish Theological Seminary. I go to shul in the Bronx. He's not situating himself in his own individual life, but in the larger, the larger collective experience of the Jewish people as a whole. 
I'm here addressing you as someone who comes from Abraham and Moses. And that's my starting point. But, and listen to the poetry. I speak as a person who was able to leave Warsaw, the city in which I was born just six weeks before the disaster began. My destination was New York. It would have been Auschwitz or Treblinka. I am a brand plucked from the fire. Listen to how he speaks, in which my people was burned to death. I am a brand plucked from the fire of an altar of Satan on which millions of human lives were exterminated to evil's greater glory and on which so much else was consumed. The divine image of so many human beings, many people's faith in the God of justice and compassion, and much of the secret and power of attachment to the Bible, read and cherished in the hearts of men for nearly 2,000 years. What is he saying in his introduction? What is he setting up? A couple of things. The first thing he's saying is when I speak, I speak with a sense of how important it is for us to fight evil in this world. I'm not coming to you to talk about celebrating and rejoicing and loving God and just loving each other and forgetting about all the problems we face. No, I'm not naive in that way. I've seen the worst horrors that humanity is capable of. And I'm here because I have to be here because we have no choice but to address evil in this world. That's what he's saying, to open it up. And the other part, the other piece, and he touches on this a lot, is the theme of disillusionment or cynicism, that one of the worst outcomes of the Shoah, and really so much of what we saw in the last century, it wasn't just the suffering. It wasn't just the violence. It was the disillusionment that people who were once attached to God and who once believed in justice would look at what happened in the world and very naturally say what you might say. How can there be God? How can there be any justice in the world? Why should I be attached to a Bible and to a God when there's so much horrible, horrible violence in the world? And people gave up on it. So really what Heschel wants to, to get at, and he's going to get at it, is how we respond to that cynicism. How we respond to people saying, forget it, I give up on this world. It's a question for us, too. It's a question for us, too, that one of the biggest challenges we face right now is people turning on the news and saying, I give up. I don't know where to turn. How can I fight, how can I fight injustice? How can I fight an evil? evil? It seems insurmountable. What Heschel's saying is we don't have, an oper we don't have um, the option of giving up. We can't. We simply can't. I speak as a person who is often afraid and terribly alarmed, lest God has turned away from us in disgust and even deprived us of the power to understand his words. Very personal. Very honest. Even I, a rabbi who's coming to you and you would think I have all the answers. Even I come to you afraid and terribly alarmed, feeling like God has turned away from us. Has anybody felt like God has turned away from us or has turned away from you in life? I think we all must have felt that. Anyone who has a sincere relationship with God that they're working on at times feels like that relationship is strained. What Heschel's saying here is, well, that's, it's natural to be, to be concerned. It's natural to feel that God at times has turned away. The entire generation that lived after the Shoah 
felt that, I'm sure, quite often. Quite often. Let me pause. Any thoughts about his opening? Can you imagine being a professor or a student standing there when this man walks up to the microphone and, and that's how he opens his speech? How intense. I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been there. Talking about God being disgusted with us reminds me right away of Tisha B'Av. Sure. Tisha B'Av, and it's, and it's good timing to start thinking about it because it is the next major day that we're going to be recognizing, not celebrating, but recognizing the three weeks leading into Tisha B'Av where we will recognize and mourn the destruction of the temple. And that is the moment, the paradigmatic moment for our people of feeling that we were abandoned by God. Echa, which is what we read on Tisha B'Av, the word ech means how. You could almost understand echa to mean, how could you? How could you turn away from us, God? And it's a day of dealing with that question. Heschel dealt with that question his entire life. His entire life, coming from his background. He was someone, though, who didn't allow that feeling to um, turn him toward atheism or agnosticism. On the contrary, he was someone who made his career standing up for the, the, the Bible, standing up for God, and really doubling down on his, on his faith in a way. And that's really what he offers to us, I think. I speak as a person who is convinced that the fate of the Jewish people and the fate of the Hebrew Bible are intertwined. The recognition of our status as Jews, the legitimacy of our survival is only possible in a world in which the God of Abraham is revered. Nazism, and what's interesting, he's speaking about Nazism in the beginning of this essay, because what was on everyone's mind just 20 or so years after the Shoah? What role did the church play? What role did the wider Christian world play in allowing this to happen? How can the relationship between Jews and Christians be healed when, though we know the Nazis were not Christians, there certainly were Christian institutions that did not help, that turned away, that turned a blind eye. And what Heschel's addressing here is I think the elephant in the room. I'm a rabbi whose family perished in the Shoah addressing a Christian crowd about interfaith dialogue and about Jews and Christians coming together. How can we move on from what happened? How can we move forward together to make sure that this never happens again? One of the things that Heschel was famous for was going to the Vatican and, and fighting so that Jewish people would not be considered to have committed deicide, the murder of, of Jesus, of the Christian, Christian God. And he fought so that on the official Catholic party line, according to their dogma, they no longer believe that. But he had to fight for it. I'll do a little bit more and then, and then we'll stop. Talk. Nazism in its very roots was a rebellion against the Bible, against the God of Abraham. Realizing that it was Christianity that implanted attachment to the God of Abraham and involvement with the Hebrew Bible and the hearts of Western man, Nazism resolved that it must both exterminate Jews and eliminate Christianity and bring about instead a revival of paganism. Why does he have to say that? Why is he mentioning this in an address to a Christian audience as a Jew? Why does that help his claim?
that Nazism tried to kill, destroy the church too, according to this sentence. According to where he's going with this, we are in the same fight. Jews and Christians who study the Bible, who believe in the Bible, are in the same fight. We have similar values. We share that common heritage. And we together are fighting against the evil of the world. And he's coming and saying, I place no blame. I place no blame. I know that you as Christians can join with us as Jews in celebrating the values of the Bible and of fighting against injustice and evil everywhere. And I place no blame. And that's how he sets up this larger speech that's about really coming together. Nazism has suffered a defeat, but the process of eliminating the Bible from the consciousness of the Western world goes on. What's the problem? Yes, we might have gotten past the plague of Nazism, but still the world is moving away from the values that we hold dear the values of Torah and of the Bible that we cherish. It is on the issue of saving the radiance of the Hebrew Bible in the minds of man that Jews and Christians are called upon to work together. None of us can do it alone. Both of us must realize that in an our age, anti-Semitism is anti-Christianity and that anti-Christianity is anti-Semitism. That is a strong, strong statement, and one that you might not expect coming from Heschel. But I think it says something to us as people, as Jews, but as people who want to work against the injustice of the world and want to join with other faith traditions, be it Christianity or others, that we need to find the ways in which our values are completely aligned and go from there and go from there. The idea that none of us can do it alone is so remarkable. And I want you to know that it was very, very revolutionary for Heschel to say that. Most Orthodox rabbis at that time did not believe that Jews and Christians could necessarily work together. They believed, well, they're so different from us in their belief system that we can do our best to keep mitzvot and try to help in our way. They can do their best to help in their way, but we really can't come together to fight against the evils of this world. We're just, we're too different. There's too much of a, of a divide there. Heschel got into famous debates with Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was one of the other leading rabbis of the era on that very issue. But I want to open it up to the class. How do Heschel's words, in this paragraph especially, none of us can do it alone. Both of us must realize that in our age, anti-Semitism is anti-Christianity and anti-Christianity is anti-Semitism. How do these words fuel some of what we might believe or some of the actions that we might take in our own world thinking about some of the work that we have to do the justice work that we have to do today whether it relates to and the said, ongoing pandemic whether it relates to some of the um some of the anger and the frustration around how african americans and people of color are treated by by, in certain cases, by authority figures. How do we hear these words today? Sharon? Well, isn't there an emphasis now on this interfaith? Uh, there was, you know, uh, synagogues getting together with, uh, with churches and, and mosques and so on. I mean, that seems to be very, very prevalent now. A big part of why that is such a powerful strategy is because of people like Heschel who opened the door. People like Heschel who said, and who really this is one of the first places you can point to where we can see it in such a forceful way, we cannot do it alone. 
if the Jewish people try to save the world alone, we're not going to do it. And if Christians try to save the world alone, it's not going to be at the same level. No religion is an island. Anybody who shares our values, our belief in the central claims of the Torah, of the Bible around justice and helping the needy and the poor and the vulnerable, anybody who shares that is part of our team. That's what he says. Rabbi, you know, I, 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 think, I'm sorry. I think about uh, how the Hebrew school went to the church, the curia of ours during Purim this year, and you were there, of course, and that was such a beautiful experience. It was a remarkable experience for sure. It was Purim for us, and it was the season of Lent for them, and we each discussed a little bit about what, what that meant. Um, and there was really a feeling of, of great fellowship. And the fact that it was Purim, I think, was, was doubly meaningful because that is a justice story. It's a story about how we respond to evil in the world, how we face it with courage. And it really did mean a lot to share that with them. And what Heschel is talking about is not just beginning there, but taking that to its next conclusion. Not just beginning with the younger students, but going on through adulthood and to the community as a whole, how do we pinpoint those issues that we as people of faith want to work on together? And then how do we join together, putting all of our religious differences aside to actually do it? Because there are religious differences. Heschel never says we should all just be one religion and fight injustice as one big, happy, unified religion. He never says anything like that. We keep our differences, but we join together to fight based on our commonalities. Cheryl? Yeah, it reminds me of that poem um, that says, you know, they came for the blacks, but I wasn't black, so it didn't affect me. And then they go through the list and name all the different peoples, you know, until it finally reaches you and, and how society in general, so people don't wake up to this stuff until it affects them personally. But this is more of that global look, you know, it affects all of us. You know, if we discriminate against one group, then eventually it's going to hit us. Discrimination in and of itself is not good. And it's as actually, if you don't yeah. say anything. The worst thing is that no, when you don't say anything, eventually everybody is suffering. So that indifference, that Hesh for Heschel, and just as Elie Wiesel and others who survived the Shoah know, indifference is the greatest evil. And we have to be open. We have to be speaking about these things. What Heschel couldn't have realized is that in 2020, we would be more interconnected. And my actions would affect someone on the other side of the world in a way that Heschel could never even dreamed of. And we are becoming more interconnected and reliant upon each other with each passing year. And so I think in that way, Heschel's words ring even more truly. I'm gonna take you through, uh, Sarah is on a point. Yeah? At the same time, we are trying to say that a, uh, Anti-Christianity is anti-Semitism, or in the same thing, anti-Semitism is anti-Christianity. When anti-Semitism is so strong now, and we are not able to say the same thing to everybody, any discrimination is against everybody. Yeah, yeah. Or no, it's a, good, it's a good point. I mean, listen, it, it's, not, it's not an equal balance in the sense that there is much more dangerous anti-Semitism that we see in our country and around the world than, than anti-Christianity, though there is plenty and of anti-Christianity anti too. Now, look at the anti-Black, the same thing. They're suffering and everybody should join them to help them not uh, to be equal. So tell me, do you want to take it a step further? I'm not sure. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. That we should never have only one group uh, suffering. We should all support them to, for, uh, for peace, for equality, for justice, mainly justice. 
Good. So we should open it up then. We're not just talking about Jews. We're not just talking about Christians, but we're talking on a much wider scale. Remember, Heschel in this essay, he wasn't talking about everybody. He was addressing a, a Christian audience. No, but I yeah. think I think at the end of the day, his fight for justice and his larger emphasis on justice and reducing suffering in the in the world would have applied to any group that we might think of. And as I, I mentioned at the beginning of the class, you know, he was seen marching with MLK. He, he was, was a passionate marching. fighter on behalf of Russian Jewry. You know, he did quite a bit. He did quite a bit. Um, in our last few minutes, I want to let someone else take us through just a little bit more of this paragraph. And we'll start to wrap up for today because I have to leave a little on the earlier side to get to the MJC. Um, someone take us through. Okay, because I've been doing a lot of talking. This is, he makes his point just a little bit more, sh a little bit more sharply here. The supreme issue. Does someone have a, feel like getting into it, doing some reading? Linda? Okay. The supreme issue is today not the halakha for the Jew or the church for the Christian, but the premise underlying both religions, namely, whether there is a pathos, a divine reality concerned with the destiny of man, which mysteriously impinges upon history, the yeah. supreme issue is whether we are alive or dead to the challenge and the expectation of the living God. So stop there. So stop there. This is amazing. I'm coming to you as a rabbi. I'm a pious Jewish person. You're pious Christian people. The biggest issue today and I'm saying this as an Orthodox rabbi, it's not just halakha. Halakha is important. The details of religious life, that's important. And for you, it's not just the church and all of the different elements that go into making, a, making a, the church service and the dogma and everything else. The fundamental underlying um, element that we have to focus on is whether there is a God who cares about history and whether we're up to the challenge of living up to that, the expectations of that God who cares about what we do. That is the premise which is really underlies the Bible, the Torah story, and, and for Christians as well. And how do we tap into that to be a little bit less focused as Jews on the details and the particulars of of halakha, though that's important, and for Christians to be a little bit less focused on the details of their own version of halakha, right, their own church service and all the elements that go into it, let's tap into the fact that we both believe there is a God who cares about history, and we have to live up to the expectations of that living God. And that is... Heschel had a way of kind of focusing us in back on what really matters. At the end of the day, as Jews, we're not going to respond to the greatest evils of the world, worrying which lulav is kosher and which isn't. And Christians are not going to be able to respond to the greatest evils of the world, worrying which color a deacon should wear on which holiday. We both need to focus on the fact that in our Bible that we share, God has expectations for us to fight for what's right and to join together. And that I think was the force of what he was trying to say then. I don't think it's any less true today. I think his challenge is still there for us to take um, and not just as Jews, but as Jews in this tradition of Heschel who need to know that none of us can do it alone. And part of the work that, that I think is upon us, our own synagogue in particular, but, but Jews in general, is to find ways to join, is to make partnerships and to join with others in holding this value of what God wants for us, for us all kind of front and center. It's a beautiful vision. Did it happen the way Heschel preached that it should happen? In some cases, yes, but in other cases, not so much, not so much. 
I think that challenge is still there for the taking. So we're not to the end of his essay, not even close. Any questions though on, on what we read today? What advice might Heschel offer a Jewish community um, on June 1st of 2020, based on what he said in this essay? I think we can imagine. I think Get we can imagine. Me. Get back to the values that you know are at the core of your Torah. Ve'ahavta l'recha kamocha, ve'ahavta metager loving the one who's not like you, finding common ground, finding a way for us all to, to begin to heal together after so much suffering. And Heschel was no stranger to that suffering. He's giving man responsibility for whatever happens to him. That's the perfect way to end, Dana, because Heschel's foremost book of theology, which we will get to, I hope, in this class, is called God in Search of Man. Yeah. Think about that title. You would think that if you were writing a book about God, it would be Man in Search of God, right? Heschel titled his book God in Search of Man because it's all about what God expects of us and what God wants us to do, not the other way around necessarily. And it's a really important flip it's easy to think, oh, religious life is just uh, whatever. I want God to do this for me. I want God to do that for me. Heschel took that and flipped it on its head. And this essay certainly does as well. So thanks, everyone, for a great uh, first class. Thank you so much. We're going to keep going. Yeah. There's, yeah, that was great. there's enough Heschel for, uh, like I said, a whole semester, an entire lifetime. I'll send this PDF out to anyone who wants it. Okay, just shoot me an email and... That way you can study a little bit before uh, before next week. I don't have your email. I don't have your email. Rabbi J. Dermer at gmail.com. Uh, okay. Got it? Yes. All right. Just wishing everyone well, and we'll continue to just pray for the healing of our world and to take Heschel's words to heart. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye.